Welcome everyone to today's webinar titled Effective Web Telecommunications. Today is September 24th and it's just now 3 p.m. Eastern. I'm your host today, Mike Lasecki. I'll introduce myself more in just a moment. Let me show you a little bit about the system that we're using today for the webinar and tell you about our sponsors. For this webinar, you're going to be in listen-only mode using your computer or your phone, and we invite you to ask questions via the question window, the chat window, really. As I mentioned a moment ago, for those of you that might have heard, this webinar is being recorded, and you will be sent a recording link. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Center's Collaborative for Technical Assistance, with additional support by the ATE Collaborative Impact Project. And here's the disclaimer, the views presented today the views presented today do not represent the views of the National Science Foundation. In fact, they're pretty much my views and take them with lots of grains of salt. What is the CCTA thing? Well, it's brought to you by five different ATE centers. As you can see, they're located at various parts around the country. And our centers tend to have experience developing technical programs at community colleges. And we're looking forward to the deeper connections with those of you that are coming from the TAA CCCT side. The purpose of our thing is response to requests from the Department of Labor. And they thought, you know, these ATE centers have been around for a while. Why don't we have a mechanism by which there can be technical assistance that is provided to TAC grantees? Things like success coaching, in-person convenings. A large one happened last summer in July at the High Tech Conference and of course this webinar series. These activities are relevant. They're relevant for those of you that have Department of Labor grants, those of you that have National Science Foundation projects and centers, workforce programs, and the wannabes. I don't mean wannabes in a bad way. I mean those of us that either have an NSF grant and would like to get a labor grant or vice versa or for those who are new to the grant world. What are the deliverers of this project? Well, topical webinars like today and teleconferences. Today is going to be a webinar. And they'll provide new solutions. They're all recorded, they're all archived. And there's other online media that will be generated as a result of this project that you see here. We hope to invite you to regional discipline specific conferences. As I mentioned, the one was held in July where we did identify and document and discuss best practices across our community. And the CCTA wants to host these convenings, as you see. I'm getting ready now because I've told you a bit about our project. I'd like you to tell, um, to tell me about yourself. So if I can manage it here, I'm going to launch a poll and ask you to tell me your affiliation. So there it is right on the screen. If you just go ahead and click those radial buttons and we'll see where people are coming from today. You can choose obviously an NSF grant, a TAC grant, both or neither. So I see people are, are logging in. I can see your percentages here and I'm going to display that in just a moment. Okay, most people have answered. Let's take a look and show the poll. And there's the results on the screen. So pretty interesting, right? About a third with the NSF grant, uh, more than half with a TAC grant, and some others uh, spreading. So that's a very interesting um, result there. Thank you for responding to that poll. Just one moment here. I'm going to close that poll down. There we go. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Again, my, my name is Mike Lasecki, and I've really had a privilege, I think, over the years of being both a principal investigator and a reviewer for NIH and NSF grants. Actually, never been a DOL grant PI. I tried to be, but I wasn't. We'll talk about that in a minute. I do have a technical background in chemistry and physics, with really a focus on lasers, applications, things like that. I was the principal investigator, the wannabe, of a round one tech grant. And sometimes I thank my lucky stars that one didn't happen. 
I'm sort of joking about that, but other times we tried to put together a nine state regional consortium for that round, it didn't work, but I learned about TAC quite a bit. And we've supported our colleges in round two, three, and four grant applications. We do have an experience here at my organization and myself in producing webinars. Pretty interesting, since 2009, we've produced 222 webinars or co-produced them, hosted them for others. And as we looked at our, our tracking sheets, over 10,000 people have registered for those webinars since 2009. It was horrible in 2009. We did not know what we were doing. The webinar world was brand new. The webinar software was terrible. Uh, we tried charging for webinars in the beginning because we didn't know how we were going to fund that software. Everything has changed since then. People now understand webinars. They understand web telecommunications. So it's quite a different world today. And hopefully we can bring you some of the results of our experience in today's discussion. I like this word, web telecommunications. Uh, let's refer to it as the exchange of information over significant distances by means of the web. Now that sounds pretty cool. We'll use that definition. What's our purpose for today? We want to more effectively use web telecommunications to manage our, manage our grant funded projects. If you've got a TAA grant or an NSF grant or, or no grant, you're typically dealing now with people that are more spread out. Collaborations are critical to these grants. So how do you do this? There is a tendency, I know, sometimes to think we, we better meet by face by face because it's going to be better. That's not always the case, and I hope to show you that today as we have our discussion. This is a two-part series. In part one, we're thinking about team meetings. They're either somewhat small teams, up to six people, or larger groups. Let's call that 12 or more people. So those are where we, we have action teams or project teams. In part two of this webinar, we're going to focus on webinars itself, how to develop them for larger audiences, how to disseminate the results of your, results of your project. It's quite a different approach, the webinar versus a web teleconference. We'll emphasize that today. So part one, we're focusing on these smaller sort of team meetings. All right, you've got to convene your team, right? You, you do this routinely once a month, once a week, whenever you need to, uh, more often than, you, than perhaps you would like. And sometimes we say, let's just do a teleconference. Well, that's fine, but notice there's some dots after the but. The web conference takes that audio bridge. It still has the audio bridge. And it allows enhancement with images that can be jointly viewed. Images, documents, you know, Excel spreadsheets, you can share those amongst your group so everybody can see them. Now you're thinking, well, why is that different than a face-to-face? -face? Well, of course, because you don't have to bring the people from distances. And sometimes people forget that the advantage of these things today is they can be recorded. So just like this event is being recorded, that can be part of your archives, part of your documentation of your project, or you may want to revisit it. It's worth doing. There's ways that web conferences can be better than face-to-faces. All right, let's convene our team and let's make some assumptions. You're gonna laugh at these. You send out an email. Okay, everybody, we're having a team meeting next Monday. Number one, they probably won't read it and they won't save it. It'll sort of register in their mind somewhere. Well, it does help if you put a calendar link in there and they click on the calendar. Number two, you send them a reminder, a second email. They're going to lose it. It's going to disappear from their inbox by some unknown method. It's going to drop below the level of the screen. Number three, for sure, they will not test their system, their web conference system, for compatibility. There's these nice little links that says, you know, click here to test if you've got the right software installed. They, they well, I'm going to say they not necessarily won't do it, but they probably won't do it. They won't get around to it. So now it gets, their calendar pops up, their message pops up. It's 10 minutes to go before the start of the meeting. And my God, they've forgotten everything. They don't know where your email is. They haven't tested their system. They're panicking. I've got to get in. You, you can imagine this happening. Maybe it's happened to yourself. So how do we manage the, the sort of facts of life, right? Oh, and I forgot. They forgot to 
take their dog out of the room and their dog starts barking in the background. There's a picture of a barking dog. It just isn't funny, these, these facts of life uh, for these webinars. Oh, let's do another poll. Let's see if I can't launch this other poll. I'm going to pull this up there, and here's the question for you. All right. There we go. How many times have you heard an audio disruption on a web call, on a conference or a web call? You know, it doesn't have to be a web thing. It could be a teleconference. I mean, I've heard barking dogs. I've heard phone ringings. I've heard, you know, equipment you know, construction equipment in the background. How many times have you done that? So go ahead and answer this one. All right, uh, lots of people had responded. Let's see what the what the results are. I'm gonna close the poll and then share it with you. There we go. Oh, often, okay, you're just like me. Most of us have certainly heard it more than once and in many cases often. Let me hide these poll results here. It's just a reality of life, isn't it? So how do you manage that? All right, let's talk about some good practices of convening your team. You want to hit them with connect information over and over again. And the way we do it is we take our agenda, which is like typically a one-page Word document or could be an email, and right at the top of that agenda, you've got the connection information. Remind them within one hour of the start because now it's going to be in the view. They'll see it in their email. It's sort of at the top, and they'll say, hey, we're starting in one hour. We always do a 60-minute reminder. It helps people. You would think, oh, we don't have to remind them, but you do. Here's what it looks like. Here's actually the, I copy this right out of an agenda. It says, there's our login. You can use your, your microphone and speakers, or you can call in. And then it proceeds with the meeting objectives, just like you would for a normal meeting. So put that right up front. You're trying to prevent people from saying, oh, I lost the connection information. You know, in spite of everything today, I would say, you know, I looked back at the meetings we've run over the last couple of years. I would think the world has moved to voice over IP, V-O-I-P. And then the next time I think, gee, everyone still wants to use the phone. I cannot force people into this one way or the other. You just can't force them. The half the world is phone, the other half just Skype, and it's all con it's all crazy. So uh, don't worry about it. But here's the thing, thing that you should do. I think you should require your team to log in, right? I've had people saying, "Oh, I, I can't. I just join by phone. I don't want to have to connect," and they've got all kinds of reasons. Don't accept those reasons for your team. Say, I want you to log in. I want you to log in to the web interface. And sure, they can come in by phone or, or voice, uh, VoIP rather, voice over IP. Either one, that's fine. Help your team. Not many of them, some of them will have struggles with this. Others, it will be second nature. If they got a MacBook, it's easy, right? It's got integrated audio and video. The speakers and microphone are all right there. You don't have to do a thing. I'd really like to suggest, and I'll talk more about it in a moment, that a quality USB headset is worthwhile for your team. You know, help them at the beginning of your team meeting. Just help them get set up here. Help them get over any problems that they have. What about a speakerphone? Well, I think many of you already know the answer to this. Depending on the quality of the speakerphone, there can be a real hollowness to the person's voice. A good one tends to eliminate that, but nonetheless, you can be in a room, you can be here picking up sounds. If you've got a couple of people in the room, they're shuffling their papers. I would say speaker phones aren't your best option, but all of us have been on these sort of things where people are using speaker phones. That's just my own opinion there. Okay, here's my disclaimer. I do not have any investments or stock in Plantronics or any of those people, but this is the headset we use here at our organization. It's Plantronics, whatever name it is, you can find it on Amazon. I like to think it's very high quality, it's easy to use, um, it works. Sometimes when we work with our collaborators, we might ship one of these headsets to them and say, here, why don't you go ahead and use this one? People will say, oh, I can borrow my friend's headset and they got one for $19.95. Well, 
those aren't as good. It's one of those things that you pretty much get what you pay for, right? So my advice is uh, outfit yourself with a decent USB connected headset and uh, just find one and buy it. It's, it's not that big a deal. Now remember we had this 10 minute thing prior to the start when people are panicking trying to join your event. Here's some good practices. Don't let yourself get distracted by this. You're the manager. You're running this meeting. You can't say, oh, let's wait for Johnny to figure out his problems here. You should start on time regardless of what we're doing. So always keep that in mind. Start on time regardless. They'll catch up. And by the way, they've got a uh, recording to listen to in case there's some problems. Sometimes people with problems will come on audio and say, oh, I can't get connected. My system doesn't work. My firewall, I'm being firewalled. Don't let that disrupt the meeting. Let, be respectful of the other people who have logged in and got set up in time. You know, at the same time, you should be there not only on time, but beforehand. Make sure you yourself or your team has got the system launched. You're there to welcome people as you came in. Today we opened up our system about 40 minutes before the start of the webinar and did our various testing. That gives people comfort as they come into the system. What we do, and you might do, depending on your team, you might have a helpline. So we have someone here in our office who's particularly knowledgeable. We give out their phone number and we say, if you're having any problems connecting, just give Janet a call. And that helps. You can take the disruption of someone trying to connect. You can just say, hey, just call Janet and she'll work it, uh, work it through with you. They might miss part of the webinar, but remember, there's a recording they're going to receive anyhow. So that's going to work for them. So use, you know, do this ruthlessly, right? Make sure you start on time and you get things going. As a manager, you must manage this effectively. You have to exert absolute control over all of the elements. That includes the chat window, the audio, any web uh, cam, things like that. You know, I remember being on a call relatively recently with one of our major projects. There was 11 people simultaneously on an open phone. I could hardly hear a thing. There was so much background noise. The manager hadn't, he hadn't instructed people about the muting functions. When you're not talking, you ought to be on mute. Then we had one person put us on hold and the hold music started on. So there we were sitting wondering how do we get this person's hold music off so we can get on with the meeting. So you gotta be absolutely ruthless when it comes to exerting your control over this. Did I say start on time? I think so. Make sure that you start on time. Don't let someone's troubles distract you or delay you. Now, we're at the beginning of the meeting. Welcome, everyone. Would everyone like to tell us who's here? No, you don't say that because you have people tripping over each other, speaking at the same time. So you have your list of attendees, and you say to them, John, would you uh, say hello to everybody? That's good. Thanks, John. Your audio sounds good. Ian, your turn. Say hello to everybody. So go around your list. And as you do this, people are starting to get he to hear John and Ian's voice to personalize them so that during the conference, if you're not using video, you can connect with the people there. Remember, this is not a face-to-face -face meeting, so we're using this opportunity to make these connections. Third sub-bullet. Don't ask who's out there. Take the approach of saying, John, can you talk to us, please? Ian, can you talk to us, please? Remember, the only identity we have at this point is through their voices. And then you beat everyone over the head with their mute rule. You say, when you're not talking, you have to be on mute. And if that happens during the meeting, if you hear background noise, just stop and say, could someone, let's all check our mute functions. You just got to do that, and everyone will appreciate it. All right, now we're going to try something a little different for this webinar today. We're going to launch a video. This one has an amazing number of hits on uh, YouTube. It's called a conference call. 
I'm not going to play the whole four minutes of this. We might listen to the first minute or so. But it's going to teach us several things. It's going to we're going to laugh about the foibles of, of conference calls. And also you can see how you might be able to play a YouTube video within your web meeting. So what's going to happen here now is I'm going to go on to mute. We're going to make our audio connections and then I'm going to start play on the video. So you won't hear anything for just a moment. One last thing, there are some connections, some colleges, some organizations that have a firewall that may not allow this video to be played. So you may not see it, but I think most of you will. Okay, here we go, going on to mute. Hang on for just a minute. Join the meeting. Hello? Tyler? No, this is Beth from ICS. Oh, hey, Beth. How are you doing? Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Just making it, you know. Tyler? Has joined the meeting. All right, well, uh, this is Trip. Who's here? Tyler's here. Beth's here. Okay, the purpose of today's meeting is to discuss the... Yeah, I'll be able to do it in like 30 minutes. John has joined the meeting. Hi, John. Hi. I was just trying to go over the purpose of today's meeting, which is to discuss the deliver. Tyler has joined the meeting. Sorry, guys, I got cut off. Is Paul here? Send him an invite. Put in your access code. No, no, no. That's your PIN number. It should be a nine-digit number. Try pressing the pound key. Paul. Has joined the meeting. Any questions before we move on? Yes, this is Beth. What's our best plan of attack for the second quarter? Question I think actually. What we should do. Oh, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, I think well, what we should do. It is actually really depends on how you look at it. Because no, the really come. So hi friends, I'm back live. So we played about a minute and 30 seconds of that one. When you have a chance, uh, I put the, uh, the YouTube um, link on that slide. When you get that back, you can pass along, or you can just you know, Google it on YouTube and you'll find it quickly. It's sort of fun because all of us smile at the various foibles that happen there with connectivity and all of us have seen it. So again, as we talk about these mechanisms for managing these things, uh, we, we focus on this first bullet here. It's called a talking mechanism. Now what I mean by that is for people online, it's quite possible to talk over each other, as you saw a little bit there in the video, without realizing it. So as I run our meetings, I try to work with people in the beginning saying that if you have a comment that you'd like to make, why don't you raise your hand? So a lot of web interface uh, systems have uh, a hand raise function. It can sometimes be accompanied by a sound to let you know that someone's raised their hand. Now you as the manager, you're looking at, at your list of attendees, you can see when they've got their hand raised. And you might say, oh, I see that John has a question, let's pause for a moment. Or you can say, John, hold on for a minute, we'll get your question in a moment. You can manage it that way. When I had our, we were working on that round one tech grant, that, the one that wasn't successful, we had 19 people on a call, uh, one of our first calls. It must have taken us 20 minutes in that first web teleconference to get this sorted out, to get people actually raising their hands. But you can imagine with 19 people, there had to be a mechanism for allowing people to talk. So that's one. Um, establish this question comment mechanism. The other approach uh, of doing it besides raising the hand is for you to call on them. We'll talk about that more in just a minute, but that's one way of keeping people engaged. You call on them and they may pass, that's fine, 
but we'll see how that works. It's particularly important in these web teleconferences to run a tight agenda. You know, everybody says that, whether you have a face-to-face -face meeting or any kind of meeting, you ought to have a tight agenda that has timing marks on it. So if you know you're starting to run way over time, you can reel it back in. Your attendees will appreciate you're running a tight agenda. Now, on a web interface like this, you'll often be sharing documents. Let's suppose you've got a Word document or some images that you'd like to show. You can have these ready to go, staged on your desktop. Many of us have been on a conference like this that says, oh, excuse me while I pull this up from my email, and now you watch the person navigate through four layers of things on their desktop. Well, okay, it's not the end of the world, but if you've got it ready, boy, does it make it look crisp, and you're really engaging your people. They feel like they're, they're, uh, they're working with a team that's got this under control. Now, as you go through your meeting, as I just mentioned, pause for questions. All of us know that some people in meeting talk more than others, right? That's a natural thing. This is an advantage of a web teleconference. You can pause and say, let's just go around here. John, do you have a question? No. Ian, what about you? Ian gives you his question. What about, uh, what about you, Jenny? Do you have got something? So you cycle through the whole room. You're keeping people on their toes. Obviously, you can't do it if you have too many people online, but if you have six or eight people, pause. Just cycle around. Do this. You know what? They're going to start paying more attention. You're engaging them more. They're not going to be checking their stock prices on their laptop, on their um, um, their iPad. Instead, they're going to be you know, paying a bit more attention. And we talked about timing, starting on time, end on time. It's amazingly how much people appreciate that because all of us are busy. Ending on time is critical. Even if you're near the end, you've got a few things to, to go. You can say, look, I know we're at the official end of our time. Just hang on for a minute. That's okay. But never let it run hugely long. That's, that's just something that will kill you. Here's our last poll. Now, to keep you engaged, I've got a question for you. Let me go ahead and launch this poll. Go ahead and, and answer, please, folks. Is it more important to start on time, finish on time, or both? All right. Everyone's piling in. This is an easy one. Thank you very much for all those. I'm going to close the poll and we're going to see our results. And now I'm going to share the results. There they are. All right. Well, yeah, everybody says both. Good. Most everybody said both. See, what I did was, holy cow, I just made a mistake. Someone's making a call. Isn't that interesting? We're going to get back to that in just a minute. It's more important to do both of these things, right? Finish on time, start on time. See, what I just did was I used the polling mechanism to keep you on your toes. We just reviewed all these things about timing, and so I threw a poll at you and say, okay, let's see if you understand this. Obviously, you could do this for a more complicated concept, but you can use questions, polls, to check for understanding, check for agreement. And, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, He's going to ask me a question. I better pay attention. All of us use those mechanisms with our students too, right? Let them know that they're going to be asked questions and hold them to it. So I'm going to close this uh, poll now. Thanks. I just did that deliberately to show you that mechanism. All right, here we go. Hybrid meetings, manager best practices. Let's talk about this, and then I'm going to get back to that phone call that just came in a moment ago. What's a hybrid meeting? Well, it's one where you have some of the people online and some on the phone. I think many of you would agree the biggest, biggest problem is you forget about the people online. You've got two people in the room with you and two people online, and you forget about them. You start talking to the people who are there with you. I was at a meeting recently. I won't name the meeting. It was downtown Phoenix. You get to the end of the meeting and everyone's saying goodbye and the two people on the phone said, oh, and goodbye. And we, you know, we actually forgot for the last 20 minutes that they were even there. 
So this is what I do. I get a piece of paper. That's actually my piece of paper there. And I draw like a table and I say, there's me and John and Wendy are in the room and Ian and Tracy are online. And I have that in front of me as a, as a reminder. So I, I'm looking at that. I'm saying, okay, Wendy, what do you think? What about you, Ian, online? You know, what, you've got any comment there? And I'm always involving them, always looping them in. Look at the third bullet. I'm routinely calling on everyone, routinely. Okay, so keep that in mind as you go through. There's a good best practice for you. Meeting details. Hold on one second while we change our position right here. Just one second. Okay, there we go. Disable that annoying ding when someone enters or leaves. Right on a teleconference or your system, when somebody comes in, it'll go ding. That is the most annoying thing. Or sometimes when they leave, ding. Disable that. Uh, you know, don't make sure you know how to disable that. It's so annoying. You're hearing me speaking, of course. But suppose you ask people to raise hands when they've got a, uh, a question for you. That's actually rather convenient because you can hear in your audio system that little ding that causes your eyes to go look over at the participant's window and see has someone raised their hand. So that's cool. It is okay to use chat. People are saying, oh, it's so distracting to have people doing the chatting. I don't think it is. And here's why. Chat is not bad. It's okay, even if you've got people connected by audio, they're on mute, they're thinking of a question, they don't want to throw it at you right now, so they put it into the chat window. Pause for some of these things, glance at the chat windows. It's not bad. In fact, one of your other team members might respond to that question or that comment in the chat window. That's good, it's not a bad thing. But don't let you, as the manager, don't let you be distracted by the chat window. You, you, oh, what's going on there? You find yourself losing the focus of your meeting if you're recording or looking at the chat too much. Often I'll ask one of my project administrators to come in and actually run the meeting, run the interface, so that I can pay attention to the chat and work the, uh, the phones, the audio system, the visual system. It really works to have a little team doing that. Don't. Don't try to give a tour of a website. Now, many of you have seen this. It's somewhat, um, I don't know, you, you sort of want to do it. Here, let me show you our website. Let me navigate through it. You start navigating through it and clicking here, and the website's uh, changing. But the problem is, because of bandwidth reasons, your team members don't see it. There's a lag. They can't keep up with you. It stutters. It goes, uh, 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 uh. It's a terrible thing to do. When I show website things, I'll, beforehand, I'll do frame captures of individual pages and show them sequentially, just much better. Don't try showing a video from your desktop. Now, of course, what we did just a moment ago was show a video from YouTube. That was a YouTube video, right? I was using the bandwidth of YouTube, taking advantage of that. Um, it's not a perfect thing because it doesn't always work through firewalls, but it isn't, uh, it is an approach. Don't say, oh, look, I've got this little video. I'm going to show it to you from my desktop. I'm going to share my desktop. That can be problematic, so watch out for that. What if you've got problems? Well, don't stress on audio problems if they occur, because they will. Let's suppose the audio problem is yours. Something goes wrong. Um, I don't know. You lose internet connectivity for a minute or something happens, some audio glitch happens. Number one, don't apologize. Number two, Check your test machine to make sure that you really do have an audio problem. You can see what your attendees are seeing. You can hear what they're hearing. Make sure, in other words, verify the problem. Number, number three, have a backup plan. And the best one is chat. Just chat in. Hang on a minute, experiencing some difficulties. One colleague uh, group that we work with has a little uh, PowerPoint slide that they can pull up quickly that says, you know, technical difficulties, one of those little technical difficulties slides, just to let people know that you're working on it. 
Number four, did I say this? Never apologize. You don't say, oh, excuse us while we made this terrible thing. Don't do that. Just say we're dealing with the problem here and keep calm. You are utterly calm. Uh, a person from your group is likely to come in and help you troubleshoot the problem until you get back on the air. Most audio problems we've had, and we have had some, have typically been resolved in less than a minute. People will hang on for a minute. They don't mind. What if the audio problem is theirs? Suddenly the chat window lights up. I've lost audio. Well, often it's a single person. So you don't want to say, oh, I see Johnny is having audio problems. What you want to do is check your test machine, make sure audio is still coming through, and then you can say, everyone, the audio is still good, and continue on with the meeting. So Johnny, or whoever it is, has got to deal with his problem. He knows it's his problem. And here's my uh, second bullet, good practice. Get out your checkbook. Invest in as high a quality audio bridge feature that you can possibly afford. It's amazing the difference in quality. The system we're using today is, is um, go, to, go to webinar. I'm talking to you by voice over IP. Some, are, some other people are logged in by uh, audio calls. It's pretty good. It's, it's not a bad system. We use Adobe Connect, and we paid extra money to, to buy a dedicated audio bridge because it turns out audio is the area where things can go wrong. And I'm sorry, I don't dislike freeconferencecall.com, but the audio quality and the robustness of it there is just not there. I, I'm sorry. I don't think they intended it to be free. You get what you pay for, right? I'm not saying anything against freeconferencecall.com, but um, it, in a professional sense, don't use it. Look, we want to make this perfect, right? I mean, how can we do that? You can rehearse. Rehearse the things that you're going to do. Don't stumble as you say, okay, what was I going to do next? Use your agenda. Rehearse the interface we're using, as I mentioned, go to webinar today. If you're not familiar with it, rehearse it because the transitions, notice how it was changing from the poles and I was hiding the poles. I'm not that great at it, but I try to take my time. I recognize you're going to be a little um, patient with me and, uh, and make it happen. Transitions, especially if you have other presenters, are important. Again, make sure you know, this is the last bullet, make sure you see what your attendees see. So here's a picture, a screenshot of our of our webinar room. In the center, you can see those two monitors that are turned off. Those are the presentation, um, that's the machine, the double monitor machine. So that's where GoToMeeting is housed and, and where it's done. On the left is a PC, PC test machine. So that's logged in as a participant. And on the right is a Mac uh, test machine, also logged in as a participant. So now I'm actually sitting here and I can see what you see as a participant from either the Mac or the PC world. That helps you because sometimes, remember, I don't see you. I, I can't see what's going on, but at least I can see what you see. It's not hard to set up a test machine. You don't have to have it as elaborate like this. You can see we've got a couple of microphones. Some of you might recognize the snowball on the right, the far right of the system. There's a studio mic set up in the center that we haven't quite figured out yet. But anyhow, this is our nice little webinar setup. More about making it perfect. Use mechanisms to engage your audience. I tried doing that today, right? I tried engaging you with some polls. I tried changing it up, making you look at a YouTube video. You can do timing. You're, you, you can engage with timing. You can say, hey, everybody, how we're doing? Oh, let's take a look. We're 35 minutes into the presentation. We're perfectly on time. You can make your webinar, your web meetings perfect if you pay attention to timing. And you know what? You can keep it light too, right? These aren't such you know, deadly serious things. We can have fun with this stuff. Why don't we do that now? As seen on Craigslist, I ran across this the other day, a custom shoe rack as seen on Craigslist. Okay, you shouldn't treat every meeting too lightly, but sometimes you need a break and you can say, hey, look what I saw on Craigslist the other day. All right, let's pause a second uh, and take a look and see what questions that we might have that we could address. 
And we do have some that, that have come in, and let's just turn the page. All right, I have a question from, uh, from the audience. Uh, are web seminar systems expensive? Web teleconference things, uh, this came in by email. Are, are they expensive? Actually, we'll address that in just a minute. I've got a slide that talks about these different uh, web questions. The second question, how do I deal with people that don't want to turn on their camera of my team? Well, that's actually an important thing, and I think one way you can do it is, is by modeling the way. That's an important way of dealing with that particular question. One more here that I see, a final one. How do I deal with firewall issues and installing the right software? What if my team members don't have the right software installed? You know, there's only one way of really dealing with that, being proactive with them in the first place, offering to set up a test session. Hey, let's get online uh, the day before the event and just double check things. You know, what we've also had is um, we have people who test perfectly and then the day of the event they're using another machine and it doesn't work. And also watch out for things like that. I'm sure you'll do it. You know, in the interest of time, we're probably going to keep moving here Keep your uh, questions coming into the chat window and we'll deal with them as we're doing this. Okay, content. If you're jointly looking at documents, the web, up, web interfaces of today are not up to 11 point font. I, I tend to send out documents beforehand and then I'll do something like this. I'll pull up this document. Here's what 11 point font looks like. And nobody wants to read this on the screen. I'll put it up there. I'll say, okay, now hold, get this document in your hands. I'll say that to my folks. And I said, let's talk about goal one, goal four, things like that. So that's my approach. After the event, you can send out recordings and any uh, ARs that you have. What are ARs? Action required. So after the, the meeting, go ahead and follow up and say, here's some actions from today. Or what we do is post the recording sometimes on our private YouTube channel so it's not searchable by the world. Um, we do that routinely. Here's a link. You can see our YouTube channel there. And if you use your meeting host to store and archive your recordings, be careful because suppose next year you don't renew your contract with GoToMeeting, well, you've lost access to the stuff on their servers. So we tend to convert our recordings and put them on our own YouTube server. It's pretty easy to do. So a few uh, tips there. Let's answer that question. What's a good web conference system? Disclaimer says, I, I don't have stock in any of these things. We just do the best we can and, and make our decisions. We started years ago with WebEx, moved quickly away from them and joined uh, Illuminate, which became Blackboard Collaborate in the lower right. I'm not saying anything against Blackboard Collaborate, but they weren't they weren't giving us the systems that we needed to make things happen for us. We switched over, and now today we use both GoToMeeting, that's what we have today, and Adobe Connect. We use both of those systems. How much does it cost? Let me give you a very ballpark figure, 50 bucks a month, $50 a month, $600 a year, could be 480, could be 720. It's something like that. That's not a ton of money. Most of your projects can handle that sort of uh, software license purchase. Make sure, though, that your things can support both voice over IP and phone options, and they should be designed for mobile applications today. That's my own impression, just our own experience. There are other systems as well. Go ahead and ask questions about that if you have. And now to the video side, that's me. All right, uh, we don't often do this, but I'm gonna turn on the camera. And there we are. Hi, everybody. This actually is a live event for today. And you can see me and me there in both things. You know, as you're running your cameras, I'm going to talk about this more in a moment. But you want to do things like making sure you're in the center of the screen. It's probably not a good idea to talk to people with your camera oriented like that. Well, that's just for fun. The problem with using video in a um, presentation like this is you can probably tell that my voice is not keeping up with the image. That's a bandwidth issue. So often, if I've got a smaller meeting like six people, we'll use the cameras and we'll deal with it. But if for a larger meeting, I'm typically going to turn off my live video. I'm going to turn it off now. There we go. I'm gone. Let's talk about video. 
First, web conferencing is not video conferencing. So here's an image I got from this place called Life Size, and they sell web conferencing gear. It's where you go into a room like this one. Here's our web conference system at our unit's office. Uh, it costs, I don't know, about $4,000. People do use it, not as much as you might think, probably because these simpler systems have really come along today. So it's not a web conference. This is good if you've got a team of six meeting with a team of six on the other part of the state and you're all in a room. What we're talking about today is where people are sitting in front of their individual machines. So make that distinction. All right, here's the problem of video in a web conference. I, I can't tell you how many times I've People call me and say, do I have to turn on my camera? Do I have to turn on my camera? The answer is yes, you have to turn on your camera. Well, that seems a little severe, but the solution here is really control your own environment and model for people what it means to turn on a camera. It's not a bad thing. There is advantages of video in a setting like this. Engagement goes way up. Personalization, personalization occurs. And you know, something like smiles come through. If you're just listening to my voice, right, you can imagine me smiling, but you can't see it. You don't have those cues. You also can see the frowns as well, right? So video really adds to it in a lot of ways that you might not think. People sometimes have objections to these things. So let's manage our video presence. Just like any other meeting, people say, oh, wait a minute, that means I have to come in from home in my bathrobe on camera. I don't want to be in my bathrobe on camera. Isn't that strange? Anyhow, manage your attire. It's just a business meeting. We talked about camera frame a minute ago and also the background and food. I'm going to talk about food. It's not going to be fun. Let's control your visuals. There's me. What do you folks see in this visual here? You don't have to put it in the window, in the chat window, but a number of you could type in things like messy and cluttered and so that's what my camera is going to see when I turn it on, right? It's going to see me. My attire is pretty good, uh, but the background's crummy. Oh, now I'm controlling my background, right? So I'm in a clean environment. I've got just a nice little picture in the background to give it a little bit of a look. Let's compare these two. So what do you think would be better for a web presence, right? The guy on the left, he's better. He's smiling. The guy on the right is frowning. I guess that's because he's not happy being in that cluttered environment. Let's talk about, um, as a participant, video etiquette, etiquette, excuse me. Okay, now, I, now I'm not the managing it, but I'm participating. You wanna control your video background and as well as your audio, control that as well. Control your camera frame, your attire, food. Yes, you gotta pay attention to that. And this is important. It's okay to turn off your camera to take care of something. Just click your camera off. That's that's quite allowable in a VO meeting. You could put in the chat window, you know, turning off for a second, that'd be fine. Uh, and here's something, if this sounds funny, don't use your lap for a laptop. If, you're, if your camera is built into the frame of your laptop and you're holding it on your laptop, it's jiggling around through your natural motions, so don't use your lap for your laptop. Now, deliberately, a few minutes ago, I had one of my colleagues call my cell phone, and I left it on. I deliberately left the cell phone on, and you all heard it ring. How embarrassing was that? So that means controlling your audio background. We did that deliberately, just so you could see what it was like when a presenter forgets to turn down their cell phone. I actually did that on purpose. I mean, I, I, we did this on, on purpose so you could hear what it sounded like. So control your audio background as well. Let's take a look at Mike. What do you see here? Well, I guess I'm giving you a clue. That's a pretty distracting background, isn't it? That's distracting. Oh, this is terrible. He's too, he's scary close to the camera. Have you folks seen people do this? Yes, so try to pay attention, not get too close to the camera. Sorry. Oh, now Mike is answering emails on another computer. You've probably seen this, right? Instead of paying attention to the camera, I've turned to the side, I've got my other machine there, and I'm answering emails. Come on, Mike, give me a break. Uh oh, I'm sorry to show you this one. Don't do this. Uh, don't eat food during a video conference, I'm sorry. What else do you see in this picture? Everyone is laughing, I hope. Uh, there's an arrow right in the middle of the frame pointing at his nose. 
you sometimes forget that your cursor is in the middle of the screen and, and you know make sure your own cursors aren't floating around there. Let's get this off the screen, it's making me sick. Mike is out of the frame, he's forgotten to turn the frame here. Okay, I know we're laughing, but nonetheless, all of us have sort of seen these behaviors uh, as we go through. Now, this is a little bit better, right? Look, I've changed my attire. I don't know if you noticed that, but I'm, I'm dressed a little bit more for business casual. I've got a little frame in the background. See that screen behind there? It's controlling my environment. It took me just a few seconds to set up that. Just worth doing, right? So I'm modeling the way, right? I'm modeling what we're doing here. Hey, what about video gear? People say, what should I use for a camera? Well, here's my disclaimer. I don't have any uh, stock in Logitech. I don't know. I like this camera. It's one of those 1080 cameras. It's a wide one. It, I buy it from Amazon. It costs 60 bucks. You can buy them for $15. You can spend more money. Uh, it does have speakers and, and a microphone built in, although I don't use those. I use my Plantronics uh, setup. Nobody asked me, but if, if you wanted to, to use this, go ahead. You may encounter phobias. What does that mean? Has anyone had a team that's afraid of, of, uh, of going onto web webinars? Would you use the chat mem window and, and just type in what message you have about phobias? We'll wait for a second while people are wildly typing in. Team members that you've encountered, you know, they're, they're afraid of appearing in their bathroom and they, they don't want to be on camera and stuff like that. While you're typing in, I'll show some of the results on the screen here. Here's a phobia. I've talked with people. One guy said, I'll drive across town to go to that meeting before I turn on that damn camera. Isn't that funny? There's just this, this resistance to cameras. I don't know what it is. Another person said, oh, I, I'm just not photogenic. I'm just no good on camera. Well, look, a face-to-face -face meeting, you're still sitting there, right, in, in front of everybody. Uh, in a way, you're on camera. You're visually connected with everybody. Well, I don't know. I can't get that interface to work. I hear people saying this all the time. And so there's this reluctance. Well, let's get over it. That's what I, that's what I say. One thing you can do as you convene your team is make your first meeting a face-to-face. -face. Make those connections with people. Number two, schedule a practice session with your reluctant folks, right? Just say, okay, let's do this. Let's work it out and use peer pressure, right? If your first meeting is six people uh, and five of them are on video and the sixth one has just called in, use a little peer pressure and maybe the next one you can move them towards it. Anyhow, do things like that. Let's talk about web meetings if you've got more than 12 people as we get near the end of our, of our time today. You've got to be in control now. You're going to have to actually take control and mute or unmute participants themselves. Sometimes you might have to require voice over IP to do that. You've got to be able to, now you've got 12 or more, 19. Number two, forget the video for everybody. The systems won't handle it. Typically six or seven is about the most video feeds they can do before they choke. So whoever's speaking should then pause and say, let me turn on my camera and I'll speak. You'll just have to manage it a little bit more. In those larger meetings, you should practice the handoffs. It's like, hey, John, it's now your turn. I'm going to put the screen share over to you. Let's make sure your audio is OK. Go ahead, John, stuff like that. If you do have presenters in these larger meetings, say you're going to have a report out from three of your key members, schedule a little rehearsal with them. Make sure their systems work. Check their audio. You'd be amazed how that pays off in the end. It does take more time, but it does pay off. It's really worth it. You know, with a small amount of experience and talking about some of the practices that we've used today, you can achieve a face-to-face, -face, uh, you can achieve something that's better than a face-to-face -face meeting, something that's more than a face-to-face -face meeting. It tends to make you more agenda focused, right? You've got to hang into that agenda. You've got to time with the agenda. You've got to respond to that agenda. And uh, number three, you've got a recording. And that can be very valuable for not only archiving reasons, but as you turn to your evaluation of your project and your formative aspects, that can help out. This is a little bit harder to quantify, but you can use this sort of stuff to adapt to your team style. 
you could say, hey folks, instead of driving from across town or across country or wherever for these meetings, why don't we try this webinar? Let's see what works for us. You don't always have to have your video cameras on, right? Sometimes you can come in at the beginning and you can say, you know, we're just going through these documents. Why don't you folks feel free to shut off, shut down your video cameras and you can adapt to your team style. You're actually formulating the way your team is going to work together. I've seen it work. I've seen people come on and just be so natural on screen once they've gotten over these couple of things. And you're giving them some flexibility, right? Mobile is now an option. The go to meetings, the Adobe Connects work on mobile devices. You don't have to worry about them holding a mobile device in their hand as they're connecting with you, but you can do it. The technology and software are now, they're, you know, they're much more available. They're, they're, um, I don't know, they're, they're affordable. Is $50 a month affordable? I think so. Um, I think so. There's a good chance, though, that your own college may have a system that you can access. A uh, funny thing happened here. We have uh, Adobe Connect on our campuses, and we said, can we borrow it? And they said, no, we're really full, and we've got a lot of users. Why don't you go and buy your own? So we ended up buying our own. But there may be can uh, times on your own campus where you can use this. Okay, so let's turn now to some more questions that might have uh, come into the chat window here. Let's, let me pull up the chat and take a look at, at what we're seeing here just a second. Okay. Hold on a second. Notice how I don't, I'm not um, worried about you not hearing me as I adjust the, the chat window up and down here. And thank you for the questions. Just one more moment. Okay, there we go. All right, let's look at some of the question uh, webinars here. Here's a good one. How many times do you actually have control over your environment? Um, well, it really depends a lot on your project. I would say often you may have to go off-site to control your environment. That's a possibility for a webinar so, or a web meeting. Keep that in mind. Uh, it's true, you don't always have control, and sometimes, as happened to me, I had perfect control. The janitor came in, as he always does, he knows he can't, came in, uh, emptied the trash, and suddenly appeared in my camera field. There was just no way of, uh, of preparing for that one, so that was good. Uh, what about in-house webinars versus contracting with a, a producer to deliver? I think that comes down to, to money, in a way. It's a good question. Uh, you'll see that in the question window. Can you discuss in-house webinars versus contracting for a producer? We we know organizations that have contracted with producers, they actually stopped because they weren't getting the responsiveness that they wanted to. And, and uh, it, it does take an investment of time to do it yourself, but I think it's worth it in the end. Um, I suppose the right contractor can give you of what you need, but in general, I'm saying, hmm, it might be worth a try because you uh, you can get control for it. Um, I also uh, thank you for some of those that said my ringtone came in loud and clear. It did, and so that was sort of funny. Here's another question: um, Can I practice my look? Like before the webinar starts, is there a way of practicing how I actually look on screen? Sure, if you have a Mac, for example, you can turn on FaceTime. And then you can see how your camera's adjusted, you can see how you appear, you can adjust the lighting, things like that. You can turn on any application that does that. I'm less familiar on the PC uh, with how your cameras come on and things like that, but it works pretty well. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, one more question. Um, I've been disappointed with the quality of my video images that I'm seeing. What should I do? I think the answer here is get a better camera. Uh, I have used some older video cameras and their, their quality is not very good. I think the quality of the image that, we're, that we've seen today from my quick, quick video thing is really pretty good. So today it's better. I appreciate those questions and your comments. Let's go ahead. You know, sometimes I wonder if you just heard me turning a page there. You have to control your environment. I got to remind myself not to be flipping and shuffling 
papers around because sometimes the audio can pick that up, so watch out for that. Part two of this series is coming up, and we're going to focus on webinar development in that series, particularly about how we design content for webinar. It's quite different than a uh, uh, the other type of format. So how do we design content for the webinar format? How do we plan and schedule rehearsals? And what about interactivity? That's a key aspect of webinars. How do you manage your presenters? How do you manage your attendees? How do you orchestrate those live events? And how do you produce your own webinar? I think that'll answer some of the questions we had today. A lot of the, the best practices, the good practices we had today will carry forward into that. I'd like to invite you to join us for that event on October 15th, Effective Web Telecommunications, uh, part two, all about webinars, I guess you could call it that. And my colleague, Elaine Johnson from um, BioLink will be, sent, will be presenting on November 19th about her really cool stuff about bridge learning communities. They've been doing that for seven years and have really found a lot of things that work. By the way, to all of you know this, but atecenters.org slash ccta, that's how you get to these things. Let's do a time check. Oh, I sort of love to do this. Holy cow, we are perfectly on time. Thank you for attending today's webinar. You know, I'm very happy if you write to me. It's sort of a crummy email, isn't it? Michael Lisecki at DO Mail. That's District Office Mail. Maricopa is our county here with the Maricopa Community Colleges. edu. Michael dot Lisecki at DO Mail dot Maricopa dot edu. Help us become better. As you log out of the sem out of the web seminar today, as the system shuts down, a survey will pop up. Just some radio buttons. I bet you could do it in less than 90 seconds, and that'll help us be better. It'll help us demonstrate to our funders that people actually are uh, saying that they, you know, they they see the value in these materials. We appreciate that a lot. It's been my pleasure today. I think you could tell that I sort of like doing this webinar stuff. I get excited. Uh, I like thinking about how to make our web telecommunications better. I hope you'll join us for part two. That officially ends our webinar today. Thanks for joining.